Hi, everyone. My name is Rithik and welcome to another edition of Lifetime Value. Today's guest is one of the most fascinating people I've met and is one of the founders of one of the oldest fintechs in Mexico, perhaps maybe in Latin America. Neb originally hails from Eastern Europe, but was born and raised in France. And he started an origination as a service company called Kiban around 12 years ago. He has amassed an impressive list of clients like Alpha Credit, one of the highest funded lending fintechs in Mexico, perhaps even Latin America. Nacional Monte de Piedad, one of the oldest pawn shops in the world, founded in 1774. New Bank Mexico and Te Creemos, which is the second biggest microfinance lender in Mexico right after Compactamos. Today, Neb shares his fascinating journey as an expat and an entrepreneur in Mexico. What led him to found a company that early in his career, being really young as well, and seeing the potential in Mexico and also the rest of LATAM. He also explains the edge Kiban gives to startups, especially in the credit space. And finally, Neb gives his views on the future that he sees in the tech space in Mexico and Latin America and shares some advice with entrepreneurs. So without further ado, please help me welcome Neb. Hi, Ritik. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, Neb. Such a pleasure having you here. And I'm really excited to talk to you because I come from that sort of new school fintech and you've taken that traditional route. And I'm very excited to explore that with you. So why don't you get us started and give us a quick introduction about yourself? Uh, what brought you to Mexico? And you know, how did you have the vision to start a tech company so high back in the future, back in the past? Uh, and what <laughs> led you to what led you to seeing this wave in, in Mexico and Latin? Well, uh, first of all, back to the future, one of my favorites. <laughs> so it, it's okay. It's, it's a good mistake. Um, <laughs> well, first, I, I, actually, I finished college uh, like one, one and a half month before I went to Mexico. It was for personal reasons. I met my then my girlfriend, today it's my wife. I just um, decided to come and see what was life here. So I just visited like for nearly a month and I really enjoyed it here. Mm -hmm. So I just told her I'm going to go back to France and just uh, sell my furniture and come back to live here. And wow. she didn't believe me. And then I came back and she did. And um, then I, for I think like a year, year and a half, I Spanish. I, I had several jobs. I was uh, still young. And then I had the opportunity to join Buro de Crédito where I had like my real first professional uh, experience in the Mexican world and the business world and also in the credit world. And um, even though it, it was very interesting for me, I think what I noted is that there was not a lot of services and maybe tech services, you know, around credit. There was a lot of major companies uh, selling software. And there was also a lot of small companies uh, bootstrapping and not maybe uh, so much tech oriented then. I believe they were more, you know, like service oriented. What I saw during my time in Buro de Credito, nearly three years, is that in the entire spectrum of credit uh, companies, there were a lot of companies that needed help. So mm -hmm. we started Kiban. It wasn't called Kiban at the time. So we started Kiban first with the compliance as a service it was about offering uh, companies the ability of sending their data to the credit bureau without having to prepare it. So they just send it raw data and we were pairing that and sending it directly to the credit bureau mm -hmm. and uh, then to both credit bureaus. And then, and that's, I think, the, the most interesting part for me. And during my time at Bureau de Crédito, I noticed that it was during the 2007 and 2000 eight credit crisis, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and what I noted is that all the companies were creating their origination rules uh, and they had to change it because after so many years giving, it wasn't giving away credit, but they are very uh, open uh, rules in order to obtain the credit. Like you never committed a fraud or you didn't, you know, have strong delinquency in your credit report. Even with weak credit scores, you were able to, to get a credit. They mm -hmm. had to change th that those rules very quickly. And there was no tool available for that. So I, I just said, why isn't there, you know, drag and drop or what you see, what you get. 
interface so that you can change your rules and quickly send them to production, release mm -hmm. them. And that's how the second service, Unico, was, was born uh, some years later, later. And now the group is called Kiban. And, and I guess that, yeah, we were a fintech, the, the word mm -hmm. even existed. Yeah. And I think maybe one of our lucks were, were to be, you know, in the right place at the right time, you know, with, a, with an offering that wasn't available before. Excellent. That, that was a great summary. And it brings me to that point um, that you mentioned, you know, you existed before fintech and you took a very sort of traditional route instead of raising a lot of capital. How did you do that? How did you get, have a company that's almost 12, 13 years old, you know, didn't raise a single cent, you know, what, what was the process behind that? And in the future, are you planning to have one of those massive rounds? Well, we could have a, a worse problem than that, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, what we like about what we do is that, uh, and, and you're asking how, how did we manage to do that? I think mm -hmm. one of the, the major points is that uh, we, we like what we do. Mm -hmm. We are focused in bringing the best service, the best product. Uh, we are constantly uh, insatisfied. So we are always trying to make it better and better. And we are very focused on, on the quality of our service and how we can work with a, with a user. That's how we call our, our clients, uh, our users, mm -hmm. and make him get bigger. So we have several, uh, you mentioned uh, Tecremos. I, I don't want to brag telling you how it's uh, <laughs> thanks to us, they could, you know, uh, do what they did. No, but I believe that we are one of the pieces that uh, made it possible. For example, they never suffered a fine from the CNBB since uh, they're working for us. So I think that wow. that's a great track record uh, about us. And also, I mean, so today, 2021, you know, it's easy to say, oh, we didn't, we didn't raise money and we did good. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, I think 12 years ago, there was no VC money for <laughs> what we did. I True. mean, uh, Mexico was not a hotspot for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that today we are in a crossroads that quote unquote old or big, even, even though we are not that big for the type of VC money available in Mexico. And also maybe in, in that part, the, the type of services that we provide are still very young. Um, so I don't know, maybe, yeah, we will have a massive run or maybe we will just, you know, continue to do what we do the way we did. And uh, we launched Colombia last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are hoping to launch uh, Peru, Chile also this year. We were accepted by um, Kubo, which is a network uh, for started by Banco Itaú in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, Argentina is also on our list. So we like wow. to work like this. What we see, and I think that you know very well about when you raise your first round, you have to think about the second one and yeah. the third one. <laughs> the, yeah. And so... Today, we're happy how, how we do things, and it's not that we don't like it, but I think that uh, it, it's going pretty well for the moment, and we'll, we'll see what the future holds for us. Awesome. I, I personally really respect the route you guys took because personally, I feel that that's how companies should have been in the first place. There is this a lot of uh, extra free money since you know interest rates are so low, et cetera, and there is this aggressiveness that we're seeing in investments, but one of the biggest caveats I see is that, you know, you've got to give up your company and you got to hit these targets that may or may not be what you're sort of interested in. You know, maybe as a founder, you want to la launch a new country, different product, et cetera. That does not go with the investor's mindset or no, I want to capture Mexico right now with like 10 X growth. And, and I really respect what you guys have done at, at Kiban. And which brings me to the next question as well. You know, you mentioned compliance as a service is how you guys started. And now you've evolved into that origination as a service, having worked in a lending FinTech before and seen maybe I would say like just 10% of what origination inputs and the credit scoring that we did for our customers back at Confio. It is such a complex operation that requires so much flexibility, that requires so much number crunching. And I mean, just thinking about it makes me confused 
you know, and I'm a math guy. <laughs> so my question is that, you know, you offer such a technical solution, which requires a lot of inputs and very needs to be very tailored to each client. You know, how do you manage such a robust system, especially in a, you know, as a startup in that sense and an ever-changing legal and credit landscape? Well, I think, and, and with my first answer, I think I can, you were asking me about uh, advice for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the, one of the, the pieces of advice that I can give them is try and find a partner that is way smarter than you are. <laughs> and how do we do that? Well, Alex Green, mm -hmm. which, who is my, my business partner and is the CTO, always challenges him, himself to, you know, find the best technology to find the best way to incorporate all the data. Maybe when he listens to this, he will tell me that I'm absolutely wrong of, of the way about describing it. But uh, we were, uh, because I'm not the tech guy, I'm, uh, I'm more the math and the, I'm an economist originally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I, don't, I don't code. Uh, I'm, I'm the, one of those founders who, uh, who doesn't code. But we switch, we switch from a SQL uh, type of database mm -hmm. to a MongoDB, which is very different. And that allows us to host the data without having, you know, to know how the data is uh, constructed before. So that also helps us, you know, to integrate more and more data points. Mm -hmm. And also we, what we call connectors uh, within uh, the, the platform that originally was called uh, Unico, now we mm -hmm. call it workflow. Today, you have those connectors and they help you orchestrate the entire workflow. So, for example, the most common today uh, type of partners that we include in an origination process are um, one of uh, two credit bureaus or sometimes both, mm -hmm. an open banking, you know, smart contract, uh, e-signatures, mm -hmm. uh, SMS, WhatsApp. So this is something that we can do by just drag and dropping and because we have all the technology behind that well this is why it seems easy but you know behind it's actually complicated yeah totally cloud based so yeah i think that um what we do today is because uh, alex has the vision to challenge himself as I, himself as i mentioned earlier and just try and have the best technology and and, and this is also something that and because you are in the in the fintech environment that you can see from time to time companies and uh, that uh, have technology but uh, doesn't have you know the the last updated technology so that this is something mm -hmm. that we try to do you know always be on edge always try to have the best one available excellent that, that's again very impressive i wanted to dig a bit deeper you know you you mentioned that the cremos didn't have a, a single violation or fine. Yeah. Now, if let's say I'm a new credit company, you know, and, and I, I remember one of your other clients is also Bien Para Bien, which uh, mm -hmm. does lending like asset backed lending, which is very yeah. different from credit cards. Maybe I'm, you know, confused. How is it possible that somebody can use this base system to do something so entirely different? And, you know, if let's say I'm a new company in the future, would I just be able to integrate with you guys and start giving credits immediately? Was that, is that the aim of Kiban? Yes, actually the, and the, the part about Tecremos mm -hmm. is that uh, the, the service that we give is focused on one thing in compliance and okay. it's around the, the credit bureaus. Got so it. we are very specialized about that in the, in the service that is now called Clean before okay. it was NConnect. And okay. Clean is focused on the compliance of the credit bureaus mm -hmm. and be able, you know, to send you data to the credit bureau as clean as possible. That's why it's called like that. Not having, you know, to worry if the, inform the information is not good, if it doesn't fulfill the laws or the, the rules by Banco de Mexico or uh, CNBB. On that part, yes, you can, you know, with closed eyes, you can start working with us and you'll be ready for everything around the credit bureaus and mm -hmm. on the origination part with the workflow i mean the way that we designed the platform is that we are completely aware that bien para bien nubank te creemos mm -hmm. um exitus credit which is a, also a good example here in mexico mm -hmm. about 
the, the way we, we, we were able to accompany a company that has grown um, is the fact that even though they don't give credit, they don't originate credit in the same way, they will use the same tools, uh, usually like you know credit bureaus and mm-hmm. uh, maybe an, an open banking partner like Prometeo, uh, SATWS or Inerio. So even though they are different, you know, the t- type of partners that they will use are pretty much the same. And our platform allows us to custom, you know, forms and variables and decision-making trees and even incorporate credit scores uh, mm-hmm. that are tailor-made. And mm-hmm. the, the way that we made it is very simple. You know, you can create a form online. So maybe, you know, um, a B2B lender will ask, you know, for... Acta Constitutiva, Poderes, and the questionnaire is way, you know, bigger than maybe consumer lender would mm-hmm. maybe would ask, you know, for six to 10 uh, info and that's it. So the way that we built it allows you, you know, to customize it. And this is how we, we are able to work with the last spectrum of, of users. Awesome. That, that is so interesting and so unique. You know, um, personally, I haven't come across any other player who is able to provide such a bespoke solution for credit, especially. And I think that's very impressive. And that brings me neatly to the next question about the business model. Obviously, what you guys are doing is very specialized and unique. And the way I've been trained in my fintech journey is that a lot of the companies like to outsource at the beginning with the intention of in-housing in the future. So my question is like, obviously, New Bank right now in Mexico is still young, for example, but in the future, they would want to have a lot of this whole credit data points, et cetera, in-house, because those are the sort of real assets that they've built over the, over the years and being able to customize a credit for their clients, et cetera. So my question is, if let's say I am New Bank, what edge would Kiban provide compared to maybe other players or even the in-house credit compliance team that they won't ever want to leave Kiban? First of all, I think that, you know, the outsourcing part is getting bigger and bigger mm-hmm. because even companies that have raised, uh, we can say now billions, especially with the last round, like Nubank mm-hmm. or other ones, you know, uh, mm-hmm. they see an advantage in working with specialists. And I think that working with specialists uh, is way cheaper uh, with the outsourcing than in-house. Yep. So one, one of the things that we do, and I think that we do pretty well, is not only the fact that we connect to a solution, for example, uh, e-signature or credit bureaus or open banking, but also each time we connect to them, we do a business discovery. It, it makes it easier for our, our users to understand how they connect and to understand what they can, uh, you know, take away from that uh, connector. So for example, we have uh, in the interface, one of the, uh, in the form creator, the fact that if you want to add like a partner, like credit bureau, and you just select credit bureau, it will automatically put all the fields required for, you know, uh, uh, querying the credit bureau. And that's valid for every kind of connector. So mm. this, I'm not saying that they can't do it. Of course they can, but yep. the time and the time that you lose and also the fact that you will have to assign someone a position to do the business discovery and you have mm. to be sure that it will be, it will be done well. Mm-hmm. So it's time saving. And after that, I think one of the main uh, mistakes that I can see, and not only in, in fintechs, but maybe in traditional lenders is, mm. oh, the connection is made. That's good. It's, it's done. It's never done, you know? Um, <laughs> True. I, I remember a quote from the social network. So uh, the, the movie when they were asking the guy who portrays Mark Zuckerberg, when is mm-hmm. it finished? It's never finished, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, like the credit bureau will never, you know, conclude its uh, credit scoring mm-hmm. uh, developments. It will never stop, you know, making new services the same with maybe Prometeo, Finerio, other partners that we have, like, I don't know, Legalario, you know, all -hmm. of those guys, they Mm -hmm. will always, you know, keep upgrading. So, and this is where we come into play. 
So we will always watch what they are doing and uh, we will always upgrade for the final user. So that's also an edge. And finally, the cost. I think if, if you go to our website, we, we have, and that's also a difference to, to other types of services uh, available in Latam. I know in the US, and I'm sure that you will, be, you will agree with me that it's common you know, practice to put your prices but mm -hmm. on, on the website, but it's not yet in, the, in Latam. True. So we have our prices and you can see that it's way cheaper to hire us compared to hiring maybe one or two developers to do the job. So I think that a mix of all that would, would prevent our, our users to have the thought of leaving. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's a very fair point. I, and I'm pretty sure anybody listening to this thinking about uh, doing the same thing would definitely have that sort of light bulb moment as well. I feel like right now you guys are in such a great position because credit in Mexico is exploding. So I, I feel like yes. right now is the perfect moment. For example, mm -hmm. we are working with Mati and uh, Mati, they are very aggressive on new developments. Basically, okay. they are sending, you know, one update each week or every two weeks. And mm -hmm. I think that if you're working within the, co the lending company, updating everything, mm -hmm. I mean, you actually don't have time to upgrade your connections or to upgrade everything every week or every two weeks. That's why they have us. Mm. Yeah, that makes absolute sense as well. Excellent. Now, one last question before we move on to the yeah. next part. Well, what is the future for Kiban? And what are your thoughts on fintech in LATAM or Mexico in the next few years? So first, my thoughts on the um, sector and on the industry, I think it, it has never been as exciting as now. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, it, you know, we keep seeing news about um, Mexico and very interesting and Brazilian companies like Nubank or other ones are coming here. And... Uh, for example, there are other countries also that have been, even though they are smaller than Mexico, Brazil, like Chile or Colombia or Peru, uh, mm -hmm. Argentina, you know, they are keep pushing to try to, to catch the rhythm. And, I, and I've seen really, really good, you know, uh, fintech uh, proposals that are not uh, yet here. So I, I think that there are a good, good, uh, very interesting and exciting uh, synergy in, in the entire uh, Latin part of the world. And, and for Mexico especially, I think that maybe still this year and next year we will see big players arriving. But I believe like in any industry, you know, when you see new offers and new proposals, uh, we will reach its peak. I have no hopes or not, you know, I, I don't have any particular point of view on that, but I think that we will reach it will reach its peak maybe in two or three years, and then it will there will be buyouts, fusions. I think because it's the normal way to go in mm -hmm. in an industry that that is young, but that will at some moment you know arrive to its its best moment. True. And for us, I think uh, we are doing uh, that's uh, breaking news a scoop for you. Um, okay. So we are really moving into uh, a cloud. Uh, base service uh, 100%. So in the second semester of the year, you you will be able to you know directly open an account with us within our web page and hire us directly in a few minutes. Wow! And we we are also exploring a payment solution very similar to to workflow because today you have a lot of players in the in the payment system. And uh, so we are partnering up with some of them, the, the biggest one, uh, in order to offer a similar approach we did with origination. Mm -hmm. So one API to connect to all the data points. I think it will be one API to connect to all the, the payment solutions. Excellent. That's exactly what my thoughts were going to be as well. The payment space in Mexico especially has exploded and there's so many players with different pricing, some things they can do, some things they can't. And having this one-stop solution is a very, very good idea, especially with all the challenger banks as well and all the payment processing they need to do. Yes. I think a, a great uh, way to exploit this increased volume in transactions. Now, moving to the next section, 
uh, called Payback Period, where the guest asks yeah. the host a question. Uh, what question do you have for me today, Neb? And basically, uh, it's a it's a double-edged question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you because I've seen that you have you know interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of uh, fintechs. What is the space in in credit or in finance that you think that is still not you know touched by uh, fintech and what can entrepreneurs like the ones you have interviewed and I can explore that uh, hasn't been touched yet? That's such a good question and I was just thinking about it over the weekend as well, which is why I have an answer for you so quickly. Oh, nice! <laughs> yeah, uh, I generally feel like what what Brex has done in the US providing that sort of company level credit card and spend management is something that is kind of lacking here. There's a lot of credit like loans, B2B, B2C, you know, asset backed, uh, unsecured. All of that has really been covered by the bigger players like the Craig Hustos, the Bien Para Bien, the Confios. They really tapped on that market, but a lot of them have not really gone to the credit card space. The cre credit card penetration in Mexico is really low. I mean, the last time I checked, it was like 0.25 credit cards per person, maybe slightly higher now, but there's a genuine distrust of credit here, especially after the tequila crisis, et cetera. But I feel that is changing and the way the credit is sold to people needs to change. Um, I mean, as a credit card owner, from you know, one of the biggest banks here, uh, I get scared because the interest rates here are insane. And you can't even miss like one day worth of payments and the customer service is not the best. You know, you, if let's say somebody does spend money on your credit card, like the security is not so good. So I think that is changing on some level with the debit cards, with some challenger banks, et cetera. And I know Clara is doing credit cards on top of that. But I feel having that B2B or like providing businesses with the credit cards instead of a loan, I think that that's a big space that needs to be explored. I know a few companies are working on that sort of card program, but I don't know when they're going to take the plunge and have that sort of big reveal, et cetera. On one hand, you see that the Rappies and the Clars are doing to perhaps me and you as individuals but no one's really doing it on a, on a business level. And at the same time, not just giving them the credit card and like, you know, you're on your own, but rather having that sort of spend management software attached to it, just like what Brex has done so that they can turn on off the credit cards easily, track mm -hmm. the expenditure very easily. So providing that 360 degree support. And I think that's, that's where I feel there'll be that next level of innovation happening. The bigger question is whether the population is ready for it. Uh, I think with the expansion in fintech lending, there's a bit more ease. But personally, I can't tell if businesses are, are really ready to take on so much credit, especially with the, how culturally against Mexico is to credit. Um, I find it interesting because the, the example that you mentioned, or I have another one. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think they do credit cards, but Mercury Bank. In the mm -hmm. in the U.S., they also have something very interesting because you can you know uh, track uh, everything that you uh, that your business pays. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's labeled the 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 bank for startups. So yeah, and and I I want to tell your audience that it's not prepared, but actually uh, we are working on a very similar project in Colombia nice. with a user called Sempi. Uh, who will offer a business credit card uh, thanks to workflow. I think mm. it's going to be a, a 10 to 12 minute origination process in order to be accepted. Wow. That is very impressive as well. And, you know, definitely the vision that you guys had when you started, it's paying off a lot with the time in market that you've had. That is really cool. Well, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask if you have any final advice for entrepreneurs. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think my first, uh, first piece of advice is uh, try and partner up with mm -hmm. someone who is smarter than you because you will always get you know, challenged by him. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that 
I think uh, helped us, you know, uh, get where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of, I, I always see a lot of, uh, of advice, you know, for entrepreneurs. I think that one that helped me a lot mm -hmm. is uh, being able very fast to buy my house and pay it off. Mm -hmm. and not be uh, uh, scared about losing everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, it may sound, you know, like uh, not such an entrepreneurial advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but actually, I think it was, you know, uh, instead of buying, you know, an expensive car or, you know, jewelry or bling, <laughs> <laughs> I think that just, you know, um, you know, buying a, a, a regular, you know, apartment and paying it off and not having to worry another day that, uh, me and my family won't have a roof. Mm -hmm. I think it helps me, you know, uh, invest myself more and more in my com into my company. Great advice. And that's, again, such unique advice, probably because you've been in the market for a while. You know, that, that's such sage advice. Uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs that I ask, you know, for advice, they're always like, the team do this, but they never actually talk about the founder themselves or you yourself as a founder. So it is very interesting. Well, Neb, thank you so much for your time today. I had such a pleasure talking with you and I hope to have you back, you know, when you have uh, taken over LATAM <laughs> at the rate that you guys are growing and then we can talk about the sort of success and the challenges you had expanding in LATAM. For our listeners, you know, you can get in touch with Neb through his company's website, Kiban, K-I-B-A-N dot M-X. And I'll also be linking uh, Neb's LinkedIn page. So if you want to get in touch with him. Uh, one other news for our listeners, you know, we, we have a new Instagram page called ltv.podcast. You know, feel free to follow and we'll be putting more content out there shortly. Well, thank you so much, Neb, and really looking forward to having you again. Thank you, Ritik. My, my pleasure. And this was Lifetime Value.